Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome to another Flare Court Media uh, mini adventure. Uh, yeah, I'm on my way to western Nebraska to go camping for a night. Uh, you say that's not much of an adventure. It's not, but uh, I need to do a dry run with all of my gear that I'm going to use for the, uh, my mountain climb. I haven't gotten the hammock out. I haven't gotten the, the air mattress out. Um, nothing. I haven't tried any of that stuff. So I decided I need to go camping for a night. Uh, one, because I like camping, but two, because um, I need to try all that stuff out and try out my backpack. Why Western Nebraska? Well, I haven't been out to Chimney Rock in about 23 years, and now that I'm older, I'd kind of like to go out there and take some pictures of it. And I also haven't ever seen Scott's Bluff, and so I'm going to stop by that as well. Uh, there's some other history out there, so if I find it along the way, I'll make sure to share it with you. But I'm also going to record a couple of videos of the gear out there. Uh, but yeah, so I just decided to stop by the Platte River here near Kearney. Uh, there's a cattle rustle going on over there. If you can hear it, you can hear the cowboys yawing and the cows aren't really liking it right now. Uh, but yeah, there's geese and storks and everything. Train went by. But so basically, I have here uh, all my gear packed up. Everything is in there. Um, drone. I'm going to Lake Miniature out by Scott's Bluff. And I looked on Google Maps and in western Nebraska, there's not a whole lot of trees, as you might imagine, but around this lake, uh, Lake Miniature, there's a few. So hopefully I can find one that fits. But just in case, I did bring a tent, uh, but that kind of defeat the whole purpose of this going out there to try setting up the hammock. So we'll try and make sure we fit that along. All right, well, I made a little detour near Brule, Nebraska to go see the Oregon Trail. Uh, I found California Hill, which is um, a historically significant uh, hill. Um, and they say over the top of it, there's nothing but California, but you know, long ways away. Uh, actually, so this, the route I'm nearby is where the trail went by the Oregon Trail. And then when gold was discovered in California around 1848, the trail switched and, and eventually they started going to California. But around here, you can actually see the tracks, and I missed my turn. I didn't miss my turn, I missed the track somewhere. So I'm gonna go try and find those. Okay, I found it. Uh, this mailbox here threw me off. I was thinking it was someone's, like, I don't know, property, but you got uh, Oregon Trail marker and uh, California Trail marker here. But apparently I have to walk in here and, and go for a little jaunt. So I'm carrying some cameras with me. because. I think this is California Hill that you're looking at right there. And according to uh, what I read, the route for the wagons forced them all to kind of go in a single file line. And because of that, uh, they left exceptionally deep grooves. And so that's why I'm hoping to come up here and see. I see this kind of sign straight ahead and I'm hoping that's the marker for where they're at. Oh, holy crap, they're right here. Ha, huh, look at that. Oh, that's incredible. Look at how deep that is. That's like... Wow, this is really neat for a history nerd like me. I, obviously, you hear about the Oregon Trail, you know about it, you, uh, play the game, but it's, and we have signs like the Oregon Trail went by here, but you don't see it. But out here you can actually physically see it. It's windy. <laughs> so all of this here looks like it's kind of beat down. But yeah, these are the tracks, right? I'm, <laughs> I am literally standing on the Oregon Trail. Look at this. I can't believe it's still here. I mean, that's it's incredible. Let's see what the sign says up here. Oh. Okay, Oregon Trail. Oh, that's it. 
Maybe I was looking at modern tracks. So those, I don't know. Now there's a chance why I was just walking on was modern tracks, but I don't think so because they're too narrow. Uh, it's just hard to tell. <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of ruts around here, but this here is the official sign, uh, the Oregon Trail. And so this, this right here is it. Like, this is the Oregon Trail. 400,000 settlers rolled across this, uh, mainly, mainly from 1940 to 1969, but uh, as early as the mid-1930s, people started to come along here. And so that's California Hill, and so they would trundle up here and make a cir circuitous route around the hill, go through that little gorge right there, which has probably been uh, widened in modern times, but like, <laughs> this, this is it. Imagine these giant covered wagons pulled by oxen, uh, you know, walking right up here, you know. Buffalo running around. You can imagine it now, right? You see how flat and, well, not flat, but rolling. You just imagine hundreds of thousands of buffalo. Uh, Native Americans would, would roam this before the white people even came. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited. This is... I didn't know that I'd ever get to see this or that it would be this clear. I mean, this is like the equivalent of, of the Roman uh, ruins, right? Because we don't have anything that old here. And so in this part of the country, this is, this would be like the road to Rome. Uh, so man, this is really awesome. I'm going to take a selfie, take a couple pictures and do a 360 uh, picture here. But uh, I hope you find this as enjoyable as me. The uh, tracks are only visible in, I don't know, like eight or nine places in the, in the country. So this is one of them. Man, that's really neat. So in the mailbox here at this little uh, gate uh, is some journals. So you can sign it. So I picked the Harry Potter one. Uh, but yeah, that's really neat. So you got all these stories and stuff. So I wrote uh, on May 11, 2019, headed to Lake Miniature for a night camping, recording a video for my YouTube channel along the way. Always wanted to see this. Watch the video at www.flaircorp.com. Let me know when you s know if you saw this. Uh, yeah, if you see this, uh, if you come out here and can find my entry man that'd be awesome hit me up in a message that you saw my my note <laughs> all right i finally made it lake miniature state recreation area so i just realized i've been pronouncing this wrong the whole time it's lake minotaur not or minotaur not lake miniature I made it. Uh, not quite sure about this camp spot. Uh, it's windy, but it seems like every place uh, they told me to check out was windy. Uh, but anyway, this is this is the spot. The lake uh, goes on the other side as well. There's actually a lighthouse up there. They say it's, it's Nebraska's only lighthouse. However, there's one about 500 miles west, the Lenoma Lighthouse. So was 500 miles between a claim of being the only lighthouse. <laughs> so I had planned to do like a proper unboxing and of all the stuff, um, but you know what, it's just, it's too windy. It's too late in the day, I stopped at too many places. I'm just gonna, gonna do a time lapse of putting it up and we can talk about when it's done. Um, I mean, you can guess what it is, it's a hammock. <laughs> so um, my biggest concern here is making sure that I have trees are, are thin enough that I can connect to them but so I'm going to do a time lapse and you can see what I come up with. So I finally figured it out. <laughs> Took forever. Uh, it's simple, but it just takes a little thinking. So, first I 
I couldn't use the spot I did the time lapse on because the ground was sand. And so the hooks, I mean, this is sand too, but at least there's some foliage. So the hooks will have ripped right out. So you have to have a tree that fits this. That was the hard part. It also has to be about 17 feet apart. Again, difficult to find. So I hate that I had to do this. And normally, you know, you don't you leave the campsite the way you found it, but I literally could not find anything else that worked. So I did that just to get it to barely fit. So then uh, you hook on the hammock. This one, the poles connect, to make it flat. You hook on the hammock, you pull this to tighten it. Uh, so that's pretty good right there. So then the rain fly took a second. So you take these and just uh, loop them up. And then here's the magic part is, if you pull this, it gets tighter. If you pull this top one and, and push back, it gets looser. So now I have a, a taut rain fly. Uh, with some room under there, so looks uh, pretty good. I don't know why the logo is backwards, but it said put the logo out, so there we go. So now I'm going to put on the, well, it's not quite centered. <laughs> have to try and center it, but I'm going to put on the uh, under quilt and then put in the inflatable mattress. All right, she's all done. So, got a little inflatable pillow. And then down here I have uh, an insulated air mattress. And this is, uh, they're all, they're all uh, temperature rated. This one I think was a 3.2 or something. So um, it's okay, that'd be like for, I don't know, like a 50 or 60 degree night. But the fact that I put this under quilt on under here, uh, that'll help radiate my heat. So this will just help a little bit more and a little more comfort, help keep the hammock from collapsing on me quite so much. And then I have this um, 40 degree uh, top quilt. And as that fluffs up a little bit more, it'll get warmer. But uh, the nice thing about this is it has a toe pocket. So you tuck your, your toes right up in there and it keeps them warm and keeps your uh, inflatable mattress together. And then there are a couple clips. I'm not quite sure what these are for, but I assume it's for maybe clipping onto something like this. So if you want to hold in place, you could. Um, otherwise, yeah, that's it, that's bed. So then the rain fly, um, go, I'll put that on. You don't, probably don't need it tonight. I haven't seen a single bug. But uh, just with all the wind and everything, I'm just going to bundle myself up. All right, now that camp is set up, I can enjoy uh, the actual camping. So tomorrow, I'm going to go see Chimney Rock and maybe Scott's Bluff. Uh, but here, I thought I'd just come out here and show you the lake. It's about the same size as Branch Stoke Lake near where I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I don't know if you can see those geese there. The wind's blowing pretty strong, but they're not moving. They must be paddling pretty hard. But if we look way out here, let me see if I can find it. The sun in my eyes is making it hard. There. There's the uh, lighthouse. Let's see if we can zoom in here a bit. hoping it lights up at night because that'd be pretty cool to take a picture obviously on a tripod. Well, uh, here I am <laughs> all tucked in in my hammock. It's actually pretty warm. I was just kind of sitting in it, uh, hanging out, eating, uh, with like seeing it like a ha hammock with my feet out and stuff. 
not the most comfortable chair. Um, and I was freezing. I had to put on my coat. I had to put on my long underwear. I had to uh, put on extra socks. That was cold. Um, but now that I'm in here, uh, all the bits and pieces that I've bought and put on this are all working. And I'm actually warming up really nice. Uh, so yeah, I've got uh, this quilt. This quilt's really warming me up. This um, reflects the heat back at you, and it's all the air in there helps keep you warm. Uh, that foot pocket's doing a nice job, making sure my toes don't get too cold. Probably going to have to pull the uh, the mattress down a little bit. But uh, and then just brought in my shoes, to make sure no critters crawl in them, and I got my pants there. It has my keys in it, and uh, just tucked my, hung my coat up over that. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Uh, see you in the morning. Hey, good morning. Well, I had to um, hit hit up the car. I was trying not to um, because I wanted to see, you know, what it would take to make it through. Uh, because I'm going to be away from the car for multiple nights. Uh, you know, up to maybe seven nights. Uh. So I was trying not to hit it, but, you know, I'm still learning my gear. But the problem was it got down to 38 degrees, and uh, my stuff with the quilt and the underquilt and the blanket ran to 40. Now, I should have been able to survive, but for some reason, I, I almost wish this was a wide um, blanket. This blanket did amazing. This top quilt did awesome, but it it was almost too narrow, like... If it were 50 degrees, wouldn't have cared. I could roll under it, but just just enough of me was exposed or my feet or whatever that my core got too cold and so I had to run into the car. I guess I ended up losing a little more heat underneath me than I thought, um, even with the air mattress and the under quilt. So something to keep in mind. So as I'm packing stuff away, I realized um, not only does this have a toe box, it has all these buttons on here. I'm not quite sure what some of these are. There's some some straps in in here that maybe I could, you, you put this on your hammock wall and then you can strap onto it so it doesn't get all tangled. I'm not quite sure, but one cool thing that I just found out that probably would have allowed me to stay outside is these two buttons right here. If I do this, <laughs> and now my shoulders stay completely, completely covered. If I step in the toe box, it doesn't, uh, the blanket doesn't slide off. And I can do this if I get too hot, but odds are it won't. So stay right like that. So, yeah, uh, this is why we have trial runs of gear. All right, so car's all packed back up. Um, I'm just going to have a little really hard bread. I love it. Sourdough bread. No breakfast. And I think we'll go over and uh, see the lighthouse before we head to Chimney Rock. So I just did that little shot of going to the lighthouse with my drone and somewhere in there I lost connection I think it's when I tried to change modes and I thought I saw the the altimeter was minus 17 feet so that means I thought I lost it in the water so I hit return home and the uh, drone somehow I got signal again I thought I lost it I didn't do high as 100 feet in the air so I don't know what happened it just dropped but uh, anyway, it came back. I'm like, but the gimbal's not working. Like, I can't aim the camera. Oh well. Get back. Yeah. It it went in the water. Like that's why the gimbal's not working because it got wet. I mean, there there's water all over it. So one, thank God it didn't, you know, never come back. Two, I don't know what the hell happened to cause it drop 100 feet into the water by switching modes. And three, damn, <laughs> it recovered from going in the freaking water. It landed, 
propellers were still up. Must just not clipped a wave right. I don't know, but it freaking survived. So way to go DJI on your Mavic Air. Uh, this little thing, I mean, it hits tree branches. It stays up. It hits water <laughs> and this time stayed up. I'll have to dry it out to see if uh, anything broke. But one, I'm mad. Two, I'm relieved. Three, I'm amazed. Okay, I uh, apparently pissed off some kind of karma gods because uh, I stopped here by the lighthouse. Thought, oh, my tire's a little low. I'll fill it up. I ho hooked on my air compressor and it didn't quite click on right, so I unclicked it and the freaking pin came out. Have you ever seen that? And so yeah, the, the entire tire deflated. And I believe this pin, unless I can somehow squeeze that back in there, is worthless, meaning I now have to put on my donut. It means I can't get any more flats and I have to drive 50 miles per hour until I can stop and get a new tire somewhere. And in small towns, most tire shops are closed on Sundays, so I'm gonna have to drive 50 miles per hour until I get to a Walmart, if they're even open. Did I tell you I was going on an adventure? Because this is certainly turning into one. In all my years of changing tires, I've never had the car slip off the jack like that. I'm almost defeated. <laughs> Well, the show must go on. I got my tire fixed. Um, the only tire place that's open on Sunday is in Scott's Bluff at Walmart. So I'm gonna make this quick and then go get that. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to show you the lighthouse here before we take off. Go inside and run up it real fast. So this is the, uh, the Plains Lighthouse. I was built to uh, between 1937 and 1939 in the Great Depression with native stone. It's built as a shelter and also an observation deck. 55 feet tall. Oh, still going up. It was built by the Veteran Conservation Corps. Wow, this is taller than I thought. Once you're inside it. Hey, we made it. All right. So yeah, there is no light, which is why you didn't see a picture of this at night. <laughs> Might have used to been, see there's kind of a light fixture. place the sensor the electric sensor so 38 bucks um, but all it took uh, unlike in Lincoln <laughs> which takes like four hours it only took about 30 minutes long enough for me to walk over and get some really bad fast food but I um, felt like I earned it uh, and then walk back and it's done well just one more thing on this trip my SD card and my dash cam decided it was time to corrupt and formatting no longer works, so all Walmart has is the gray ones. I prefer the gold, but oh well. Now I'm not, uh, I don't have time to go exploring Scott's Bluff National Park, um, 
but I reckon I can give you the uh, nickel history tour while we're here. So these were formed uh, basically a long, long ago. There was an ancient sea covering all of Nebraska. Uh, that is actually on the bottom of the, the monument. You can't even see it. Uh, then the, the ground started to raise up and uh, when that happened, the sea receded and the Rocky Mountains started to rise up. And as they're coming up, the wind and rivers are bringing the sediment from them down into the plains of Nebraska. So that forms the very bottom layers here. Then we get volcano eruptions. So uh, this is like 30 million years ago, long time. Um, volcano eruptions in Colorado. Think of Mount St. Helens with the huge plume of ash that blew across the entire United States. Uh, we had several of those happen and in Colorado, and so they deposited a thick layer of ash on the monument. Uh, then we continued to rise a little bit more with an inter, it would go really, really dry, so you'd get sand and sand dunes, and then it would be wet, and so you'd get some calcium carbonate from the rivers coming through, kind of alternating, and sand dunes would waft across the western panhandle of Nebraska. And then we see the final raising of the earth, and that's uh, where it's at now, raised up to uh, the, the top that you see, and that uh, then allowed rivers and wind to start eroding it down. And so it's eroding through all of those layers. And so you can, geologists can go over there and see, here's the ash layer, here's the sand layer, here's the calcium carbonate layer. And so in certain areas, the, the type of stone at the top um, has allowed the rain not to erode certain areas. So that's why you see some of those pillars. But yeah, it all started with an ancient ocean on the bottom and it's worked its way up. They may be wondering, okay, how did it get to his name, Scott's Bluff? Well, it's named after a guy named Hiram Scott. Uh, he uh, was a fur trapper and died in 1828. Uh, he was abandoned by his companions and died at the base of the bluffs somewhere. So there's more in there you can drive in through them. It's kind of like the Badlands, only reverse instead of going down, everything's up but uh, they'll have to, have to wait for another vacation. Did you know there are more cows than there are people in Nebraska? So I finally made it back to Chimney Rock 25 years later. I'm glad to see it still standing there. Uh, and they say it'll be standing for quite a while. Now it's not as tall as it was back in the day when the uh, Oregon Trail and stuff went through. It has gone down a bit, but it's you know still pretty impressive. Uh, more impressive actually now as an adult than I thought it was as a child. As a child, I thought it'd be like way taller, but I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, it's actually part of that, it originally was part of that bluff over there. And the sandstone on top of it has protected it from erosion as the bluff scooched away. And so it left this, this pillar all by itself out there. Of course, when I want to record, it starts being windy, but you know, Western Nebraska, there's a lot of wind. And so that's what actually caused it to uh, form, is the sandstone cap on top. Like you see in a lot of um, uh, Utah National Park and all that stuff, the big rock on top protects the shaft underneath it. That's the same thing that happened there. Uh, it stands 325 feet tall from the base to the top and over 400, I think 20 feet to the uh, floodplains down here. Uh, it's actually taller than the uh, Statue of Liberty, which is 305 feet tall. It's Nebraska's most famous landmark, and that's because the Oregon Trail and the California Trail and the uh, Mormon Trail to Utah, they all use this as a, a landmark, including the fur traders that were here um, before any of those trails came over back in you know, 1800 to 1820. The fur traders used it, and even going back further, you got the Native Americans. But this was a landmark that told the people on the trails uh, that their time in the boring flat places, all these trees were not here. This was just barren and it was just an endless sea of, of flatness. And so this was their symbol that they made it through the, the barren plains and were now entering the Rocky Mountains, uh, which you know, beyond the ways starts to get more mountainous and hilly. I had a little wind nub on here and it keeps blowing, it blew away, like off my shirt. I kept losing it in the car, 
finally when I need it, when I'm going to talk to you and use this microphone that I've been carrying with me. Poof. There it goes. That's what, like the fifth thing that's happened? Well, I really wanted to give you a bird's eye view of Chimney Rock, but um, looks like right now the gimbal is just dead. Yeah, that's the last thing I need, so I'm definitely heating that with my string of bad luck. So you might be asking what caused the settlers to come over from uh, the Oregon Trail. Well, after the War of 1812, uh, both England and the U.S. owned the Oregon country. They had a joint uh, agreement that they both owned it. Uh, they forced Russia, who also had a stake on it, out. Uh, and so, as you know, sharing things doesn't always work that well. And uh, Britain wanted to make the Oregon country part of Canada and the U.S. They believed in manifest destiny, which means that they believed the U.S. should stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so Andrew Jackson, in his last couple months as president, uh, started the Oregon Trail movement uh, in an effort to force the British out. Uh, he wanted to beat them, and they couldn't do it militarily, they couldn't send an army there. Uh, he said the only way to do it is to send settlers there before Britain can, can get a foothold in it. They, they sent the first cover of wagons over there, they came rolling right by here. They all saw this uh, on the, the Platte River Road that um, the fur traders had built. And then um, continuing on, the Oregon Trail is about 2,000 feet long from Independence, Missouri to Oregon. And uh, along that way, uh, like I said, some 400,000 people travel along it. And uh, 20,000 people died, I believe. So that's uh, about 10 people per mile. But, you know, that's, that's how it was. But one other interesting tidbit about the Chimney Rock is the Pony Express ran by here as well. Um, it was a very short-lived, I think, 18-month uh, mail service that ran Letters West. And um, the Pony Express, one of the writers would have written right by here when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. So taking the news out west for the uh, people in California. 